Okay, uh, I have to remind myself, don't say good morning. It's good afternoon. But good morning to people in Hawaii who are uh, tuning in. Um, I'm so glad to be here today to get to talk to you about money. My husband said he's attended every Mises University since 88. My first one was in 92, and I have not been to every single one since then. Sometimes I had babies and things like that, but I've been to a lot of them, and it's the best week of the whole entire year. Christmas is nothing compared to this. So um, so anyway, I'm so glad. Uh, yes. Um, I'm so glad to be here with you and um, just excited for y'all to get to experience this. So we have the topic of money on our first day um, because for Austrian economics, money is really a central theme. We have analysis is done in money prices. Calculation is only possible with money prices. And we can even say, um, as Dr. Rittenauer was talking, uh, civilization can develop. We can have division of labor and exchange, and it's going to be facilitated greatly by uh, money, money prices. So some of our um, great contributions have been, uh, the Austrian school have been in money. Carl Minger's great uh, on the origins of money in 1892, 20 years later. Mises uh, had his first book he, where he expanded Minger's approach. They had the, developed the regression theorem in theory of money and credit. And then, of course, also we have Rothbard, um, what has government done to our money and others. And my favorite I put on here was the mystery of banking. So if not for the Austrians, we may still have the state theory of money, where money is whatever the state says it is. It's just by uh, their sovereign decree that this is going to be money. Um, <clears throat> So that's why we need to talk about money on the first day at the beginning of the week here. So um, <clears throat> who needs money? Robinson Crusoe would have no need for money. Um, he can't eat gold coins. Um, there's no, if he's on the island by himself, there wouldn't be, if he had gold coins, there wouldn't be a shopping mall where he can go and spend the gold coins. He has really no need for money. Even when he meets Friday, his friend on the island, there's really no need for money. They can just exchange fish and berries based on subjective valuations of the fish and berries. But when society begins to expand beyond just a few families, the stage is set for the emergence of money. Money can come about. So from Sean Rittenauer's lecture that just finished, we learned that voluntary exchange occurs because both parties expect to benefit. Both parties expect to be better off, and we have specialization in exchange. People are uh, producing goods, not just for their own consumption, but also for exchange. Um, we develop uh, uh, our best skill to become more proficient and more efficient, and so through that, as Dr. Rittenauer explained, we have higher standards of living. <clears throat> um, as opposed to uh, being self-sufficient when uh, we can get things through exchange um, under being under self-sufficiency, most of us, we can imagine we would be nearly starving, right? If we had to produce everything we we're going to consume. Okay, but when we have exchange, direct exchange of goods for goods, or what we call barter, um, which hardly better than remaining self-sufficient. Okay, there are a lot of problems with barter. There are two uh, big ones that I want to talk about Oh, I did get it into the wrong slide. I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, limitations of barter I want to talk about is the, the indivisibilities of goods and the double coincidence of wants requirement. So we can imagine um, how difficult barter would be. We'll just have a little thought experiment like Barney. It's fun to use your imagination. Um, we'll be pretending to impose a... Uh, barter requirement in the world of Facebook Marketplace. Have you all used Facebook Marketplace and sold things in these kinds of communities? So I am into gardening. I enjoy gardening, and I just recently created this huge flower bed, so big that I immediately regretted my decision to do so. But anyway, I was looking on Facebook Marketplace for stuff to fill it. Okay, I was looking on Facebook Marketplace for stuff to fill my flower bed. What I had in mind when I went on Facebook Marketplace, I was looking for plants. Okay, but then on Facebook Marketplace, I came across this yummy little treasure. 
this guy here as <laughs> uh, dinosaur eating gnomes. So of course I had to have it. <laughs> of course I had to have it. So in this world, if we have only um, <clears throat> only barters allowed on Facebook Marketplace in our imaginary world, then uh, the seller says, well, the only thing that I want is I'm looking for a used Papasan chair. Well, I'm in luck. Uh, good thing I have the used Papasan chair. You can notice the seller there. And underneath, you might notice that it highly rated on Marketplace sellers. Um, just a little another feather in my cap. Um, okay. But what if, um, okay, so if this is, we can agree, we can say uh, she has the great dinosaur no meeting yard art and I have the used Papasan chair, the exchange can be done, great. Okay, but what if we have the case where um, the Papasan chair is much more valuable than the, much more valuable in exchange than the yard art? Okay, maybe even 10 times more valuable. Uh, now, what are we going to do? Well, no, 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 no. We can, I can take the chainsaw and I can cut up my Papasan chair, but then what have I done to the value of my Papasan chair? Now my Papasan chair is almost nearly, nearly worthless because I've divided it up. So, indivisibility of many goods is going to be a hindrance to trade under barter. <clears throat> Okay, even when the goods are divisible, though, um, into smaller units, it's very difficult for traders to find each other under barter because in barter, a double coincidence of wants is required. I have to have what you want, and you have to want what I have, okay? And I have to want what you have. Okay, so if I have this used Papasan chair to sell, and you have this really great yard art, how are we going to get together if what I really wanted was a rose bush, right? So now change is not going to, trade is not going to take place if we don't have this double coincidence of wants. Um, hitting a little bit closer to home for a lot of us in this room, think of an economics professor. To eat, the economics professor has to find someone who wants a chef who wants to prepare a meal in exchange for economics lectures. This is, we're going to all be pretty hungry. And in fact, y'all, I cannot believe that I was able to get this, but I have an actual photo that I can share with you today um, of some of our Mises U faculty here this week. Uh, but this was when they were living under a barter economy. Here they are. There's Salerno, Gordon, and Klein. And they were, they were pretty hungry. So anyway, anyway. Uh, so another problem under barter is because every good trades against every other good in barter, if we're just trading goods for goods, then each good has a whole array of prices. In a barter economy with only 1,000 goods, um, <clears throat> there would be 499,500 prices. So if we just imagine a Walmart, I looked this up, Walmart, a typical Walmart store carries over 120,000 goods, 120,000 goods. So an outrageous number of prices would be required for each good to be denominated in the prices of every other good <clears throat> without money. So Mises said, money becomes more necessary as division of labor increases and wants become more refined. As we're looking for um, things that are, <clears throat> uh, you know, as the division of labor expands and increases and goes forward, and we're looking for a particular kind of light bulb, right? We're looking for the kind of light bulb that goes in the microwave. You don't even think about that light bulb. You just, when it's on, when the microwave is going, the light's on. We're looking for one of those. It's going to be even more important to have, it's going to be even more important to have money. Okay, so under, um, <clears throat> From looking at just these examples, we can see how without money, under barter, we're not going to have a very developed, advanced um, economy. It's just not going to be possible under direct exchange or barter. But under indirect exchange, you sell your good, 
or your labor or some service, you sell that not for the good that you want directly, but you sell it for another good that you can then in turn go and trade it for something that you do want. So at first, you think, gosh, this just seems like this is an adding an extra step. This is making it kind of clunky. Why don't, if I want a rose bush, why don't I just take my papa's on chair and go get some rose bushes? I now have to take my papa's on chair and get something else and then go trade that for the rose bush. It seems like it's clumsy, but this is actually a very uh, huge step for just the development of civilization that we can have money. I mean, when we have money that will allow us to facilitate these exchanges more easily. So under barter, you can imagine, how, how are we going to get from barter to money? We can imagine there is a degree of sellability of goods. Goods have a different degree of sellability. Some of them are more saleable than others in terms of being able to find trading partners for these, for the goods that you have. Um, <clears throat> The more saleable good, the more easily it's going to be for you as the owner of that good to find a buyer for it at the particular price. So somebody selling potatoes is probably going to have an easier time finding buyers than I will with my Papa's on chair. I'll have a more difficult time finding trading partners. Of course, it's not impossible because I could always just be willing to accept a much lower price, right? I could get except something much lower in value than what I think my uh, Papasan chair is. So the owners of the goods, like me with the Papasan chair um, and other less saleable goods, we would um, begin to exchange our products for the goods that's not exactly what we're looking for. It's not what we're wanting, but we will accept another good as long as the good we're accepting is more saleable than the one we gave up then now we're closer and closer to getting the goods that we do want. Minger argued that over time, the most saleable goods would be desired more and more um, by traders because of this advantage it gives them in getting the goods that they do want. Okay, The demand for this very saleable good... <clears throat> The demand for this very sellable good changes then, so it's not only demanded for its use value, you know, these goods that become, that eventually become money, they had some use value, but now the demand for it changes. It's not just the value and use, but also the value that it has in exchange because of its very uh, saleable nature. So the choice of a good or goods as a medium of exchange is a gradual self-reinforcing process. And as more people accept the more saleable good, the commodity then becomes even more marketable. Okay, so what makes a good, uh, what makes a good more likely to become a medium of exchange? Well, first of all, from the Papa's on chair, we know that we want it to be easily divisible into smaller units without losing value. Okay. We also want it to be durable, where it lasts and holds up over long periods of time without uh, breaking down while it changes hands frequently. We want it to be easily transportable. We want it to have a high value-to-weight ratio. So this is why we wouldn't expect to have you know, iron or something like that as money. Also fungible. We want it to be where one unit of money is just the same as or basically equivalent as any other unit. We also want it to be scarce. So eventually, one or two commodities are used as a generally accepted medium of exchange, and that is uh, generally accepted by that. Of course, generally accepted, there is some room for interpretation, but by that, what we mean is that in almost all exchanges, or the overwhelming majority, most exchanges, uh, this medium of exchange is used, then we'll say it's this good or this commodity is money. Okay, so historically we have these examples of um, other things that have served as money through history, beads, wheat, shells, nails, but through the centuries we've seen throughout history um, <clears throat> two commodities, gold and silver, have displaced most, um, have ex displaced these other commodities and have been the generally accepted medium of exchange. Okay, some critics will make fun of us and 
criticized, they're critics, they criticize us for this, uh, Austrians for this, and they say, oh, you're just a bunch of gold bugs, and they make fun of us like they think we just like it because it's shiny and it's pretty, and we have some kind of obsession like this guy. This guy here says, I love gold. I like the taste, the smell, the feel of it. Okay, no, that's really uh, not it at all. Gold just happens to be the commodity that the market has chosen most often, and we'd be just as happy with some other um, commodity if the market had chosen that instead. Um, Carl Minger pointed out it's not necessary or even conceivable, conceivable for money to be established by some authoritarian decree or even by some um, <clears throat> explicit contract among the citizens. In fact, there's no historical record of money ever arising in that way. Um, it just cannot be found in history. The more plausible explanation is that money originates spontaneously because <clears throat> there is an immediate and obvious benefit to those who are trading under barter. To rec they recognize I am better off if I'll accept this more saleable good. And so um, it's more plausible that money has come to be in that way. So um, it's hard to imagine anybody really conceiving of money to have some uh, king say, oh, we've got people running around trying to find traders under barter, and I think it would be better if we had money. I mean, it's not really conceivable that somebody would come up with that absent, really experiencing it themselves. So um, Minger's quote said, he says, uh, hence it's also clear that nothing may have been so favorable to the genesis or the origin of a medium of exchange as the acceptance on the part of the most discerning and capable, capable economic subjects for their own economic gain and over a considerable period of time of imminently saleable goods in preference to all others. <clears throat> okay. Um, money is unlikely to have originated in any other way because, also, another reason, because embedded in the demand for money is the knowledge of the past prices, that this good was, was in exchange for barter, right, and we had an idea of what it would exchange for then, so now as it becomes money, we already have this knowledge of the past prices. So, um, <clears throat> unlike consumption goods, there must be this pre-existing price for us to be able to have some ground to base our demand for it. Uh, Mises' regression theorem explains that can only happen by beginning with a subjectively useful commodity under barter. Then we add this demand, this other dimension of the demand to it for the medium of exchange, and we have, of course, the previous demand just for the use value of it. Okay, so how do we um, transition from gold being a medium of exchange to having paper money now? Well, paper doesn't have very much intrinsic value, right? All the time when we're cleaning up our house, we see or we get go to the mailbox, we're just throwing away paper like it's nothing. Right, so paper doesn't have intrinsic value. And people wouldn't, we wouldn't expect people to be willing to surrender real goods that we have worked or to get, or even our labor, we wouldn't be willing to trade that for paper. <clears throat> also, you've probably noticed that gold is heavier than paper, right? And it's dangerous to carry it around. You get hit in the head, somebody takes your gold, it's gone, right? So, um, People would put their gold into secure warehouses, and they would get, when you leave your gold there, you would get a paper claim for it. So you have this paper claim that I have this many ounces of gold stored in XYZ warehouse, okay? So then to make a purchase, I could either take my receipt, my paper claim down to the warehouse and get the gold and move it to the seller of whatever good it is I want to buy. Or for my convenience 
and let's face it, I'm a little bit lazy. For my convenience, I would rather just take my paper claim to the seller and say, here, I'm just going to sign my name over, pay to the order of John Doe, you know, Sandy Klein, here's my signature, and now you have a paper claim, and now you can get my gold and go use that to for your purchases, okay? But eventually, the paper claims, because people found that it was safe and secure and easy for them to leave the gold in the warehouse, then the paper claims became used as a medium of exchange. Okay, so um, now uh, that's how we've gone from uh, barter to uh, commodity money now to paper currency, and we're this far in the lecture, and some of you are thinking um, she hasn't mentioned cryptocurrency yet. Didn't, didn't, uh, didn't El Salvador just say that people can pay their taxes in Bitcoin? Why isn't she talking about that? Okay, yes, you're right. Cryptocurrency is being used with a lot more frequency now, and... And that's very encouraging, that's very exciting, but we still can't say uh, that it fits the definition of money, right? It's not a generally accepted medium of exchange yet, although we are definitely moving more and more in the direction of, uh, of it becoming that. And I see people shifting uncomfortably in their chairs like, oh, I can't wait to get this woman after her lecture. Um, I'm happy to talk happy to talk about it after, but for this purpose, we're going to say it's still uh, it's still not a generally accepted medium of exchange. Okay. Um, all right, so let's talk about the benefits of money. Now we're out of barter and we have money. So the problems of barter are gone. We don't have to worry about indivisibilities, and we don't have to worry about uh, the double coincidence of wants. Um, we also have we have a reduction in the number of prices. Um, every good is now priced in one thing in the money unit. There's one price for each good. Um, we've also seen that without money, there could be no specialization, and so um, no advancement of the economy above a primitive level. But with money, uh, we can have this elaborate structure of production can be established, um, <clears throat> where land, labor, capital goods... All of these inputs are now cooperating to advance production, at, and at each stage of production, they're receiving payment in money, okay? Also, with money, we can have rational economic calculation. Now, businesses can tell. They can perform the calculation. Am I earning a profit? Am I earning a loss on this? Because revenues and costs are both done in the same terms. Okay, um, also without money, uh, with money, people can compare... Uh, the values of different goods. So if you have a 24-inch iMac, it costs one ounce of gold. An ounce of gold is now about $1,800. A new Nissan Leaf would cost about 21 ounces of gold. So we can make this comparison, and we can say that a Leaf is worth about 21 of the iMacs. Okay, most physical golds are sold in terms of weight, like tons, pounds, grams, ounces, and the size of the unit that we choose, or that is chosen um, for the currency, ultimately makes no difference at all, right? Because all units of weight are convertible into each other. When we go to the doctor and we stand on the scale and there's this really huge number and I'm freaking out, then they tell me, oh, well, that was not in pounds, and I'm like, thank God. So anyway, they, th there are other units of measurement, and they can be easily converted one into another, right? So it really doesn't matter um, <clears throat> if we choose a pound, which is 16 ounces, and then, or if we choose grams, one ounce is 28.35 grams. It really doesn't matter because they can be converted to uh, converted easily. So. I can sell something for one ounce of gold in the U.S., or I can sell it for 28.35 grams of gold in France. It's identical, same thing. So this all seems obvious when we're saying it now. You're looking at this, and you're saying, okay, she's kind of belaboring the point, move on. But 
People all the time forget this really simple truth, and because of that, there's a lot of confusion because people tend to think of the money as some abstract units of something, right? But even when we're on the gold standard, people would think of money in terms like this. They'd say American money was dollars, and French money was francs, and German money was marks, et cetera. Everybody had their own name for their currency. But all of those were tied to gold. They were names that were just given for some weight of gold. Um, <clears throat> because people got used to thinking of the currency as the name, as a dollar or the mark or the franc, instead of some weight of a commodity, um, it was easy then for countries to break that tie and just go off the gold standard. So uh, before, um, it, before the government had, before government's fiat money, the various names given for their currencies were just names for some defined weight of gold. Uh, on the gold standard before 1933, people would say that the price of gold was, they said it this way, fixed at $20 per ounce. The correct way of looking at it would be to say the dollar was the name given for 120th of an ounce of gold. That is a more clear, straightforward way of thinking of it. <clears throat> but because people uh, were totally missing that, um, that the monies were just named for units of weight, it was misleading to talk about exchange rates. And the dollar uh, did not really, or the pound sterling did not really change uh, exchange for five ounce, uh, five dollars, sorry. The pound sterling did not really exchange for five dollars. The dollar at that time was defined as one twentieth of a gold ounce, and the pound sterling at that time was one fourth of a gold ounce. Therefore, it was really one fourth of an ounce of gold exchanging for five twentieths of an ounce of gold. And you remember reducing fractions? Stay in school, learn your fractions. Uh, so there's really, uh, one pound and five dollars is one fourth of an ounce versus five twentieths of an ounce. Okay, so what about the specific value of money? What exactly is the price of money? What can money command in the market? Well, let's start with something other than money. Let's think about my laptop. So I have a used laptop and it wasn't the greatest to begin with, but anyway, my laptop, if I took this to the market, to Facebook Marketplace and tried to sell it, I could maybe get, I imagine, maybe $150 for my so-so laptop. So <clears throat> then we would say the purchasing power of my laptop is $150, right? $150 is what my laptop can command in money in the market. Or I could say that $1 buys how much of my laptop? $1 buys one 150th of my laptop. So it's the same thing with money. Uh, if I sell money, what could I get in exchange? Well, the laptop just traded for money, but money trades for everything else. So we need, the, to, we need to list the possibilities of all things that a dollar trades for. A dollar could be one fiftieth of my laptop. It could be one pack of gum. It could be one thirty thousandth of a car, right? So we have uh, the purchasing power of money then is this whole array of the quantities of all the other goods and services it commands in exchange. The purchasing power of the dollar uh, we think of it as being the inverse or the reciprocal of the overall price level of the level of prices we have for all the goods. So what happens then if the overall price level in the economy doubles? What happens to purchasing power of money then? Purchasing power of money then is cut in half when the prices have all doubled. So <clears throat> um, the purchasing power of money can be thought of as the price of money where that price or value is determined by supply and demand, just like supply and demand determines our value in exchange for other goods in the market. So if any good, if there is an increase in supply, <clears throat> if there's an increase in supply of the money, uh, then the value in exchange is going to fall. If there is a decrease in supply, 
then we would expect that the value in exchange would rise as it becomes more scarce. So um, if, a demand, if the demand for money decreases, then its value in exchange falls. And so when I say demand for money, some of you may think, what? I ne would never have a decrease in demand for my, my, I would never have a decrease in my demand for money, right? I always want more money, more money, right? But uh, de by demand for money, we don't mean how much money we'd be willing to receive as a gift. We're talking about the amount of money we wish to hold in cash balances. So keep that in mind when we go to this example later on about <clears throat> when we're increasing the money supply. Okay, so uh, what is the optimal supply of the optimal supply of money? Uh, we always hear about the Federal Reserve increasing or tightening the money supply. What should the money supply be? What should the money supply be? Um, uh, should we have more money in circulation or should we have less? Is there an optimal amount? Does that optimal amount ever change? Rothbard pointed out this is a silly question. What is the optimal amount of money to have? Because he says nobody's asking what's the optimal amount of what is the optimal amount of uh, pizzas to have in the economy? What's the right number of pairs of tennis shoes to have? Um, <clears throat> if we were talking about consumer goods like pizzas, like tennis shoes, like the yard art, the papasan chair, an increase in those kinds of consumer goods or even producer goods, which are used up and worn out as we are consuming and using them in production. Um, though, if we had an increase in those, that would make us better off. We would have some benefit to society for having more of those because more wants are being met. We have more of our needs being met with, we have an increase in production and consumption goods. Okay, money is different though. Uh, it's a medium of exchange. Money is not used up. Money is not destroyed. It's just transferred from one cash balance. It's transferred from one cash balance to another. So that's why any amount of money, any amount of money or money supply is going to be just as good as any other in performing this medium of exchange function, right? The purchasing power of money is just going to adjust the purchasing power of money is going to adjust to permit all the exchanges to incur. Every exchange that people desire to make can be facilitated with any amount of money that we have. A money supply of $20 billion is going to be able to finance the same number of transactions as $200 billion. With a smaller money supply, the price level will just be lower. Uh, with a higher money supply, a larger money supply, the price level will just be higher. <clears throat> okay, so here's this example I wanted us to remember about our demand for money. So uh, we can see the effects of an increase in the money supply when we look at the Angel Gabriel model. Okay, uh, in this model we have a benevolent but really economically ignorant spirit uh, Angel decides, uh, Angel Gabriel decides he wants to benefit all mankind uh, by descending to earth one night and magically doubling everybody's cash balances while they sleep. So we're sitting here thinking now, we like this, Gabriel. This is a good guy. But let's think about this, what happens when everybody wakes up the next day. So uh, Everybody wakes up, we find we have excess cash balances, this the more than we demand to hold in cash balances at the prevailing current price level. And so we rush out and spend our surplus, okay? What does that do? Well, there's an increase in demand for goods. What happens when there's an increase in demand for the goods? The prices will, the prices will rise when there's an increase in demand for goods. And so we'll see that um, <clears throat> uh, the increase in this, in our cash balances has just ended up increasing the price level. So society was no better off, no additional human wants were satisfied because the supplies of all consumer and producer goods were not changed, just our cash balances were changed, right? And so um, resources remain fixed. We just now have double the money to pay for it at the, the double prices. So no additional needs have been met. So even though the angel doubled the number of monetary units that we had, the real money supply, that is what that money supply can actually buy, 
money supply divided by the price level. That's remained unchanged, right? We doubled the money that we had. But we've also doubled the prices. And so um, the purchasing power of that money has been cut in half. But if we look a little bit more closely at what the angel did, we see that some people actually did benefit at the expense of some other people. Even though we all had the same proportional increase, our cash balances all doubled, um, <clears throat> we still see that some benefit at the expense of others. So the early birds, or the people that I call the freaks, they woke up early and they rushed out, these impulsive weirdos, rushed out and they spent all their money before the prices rose, right? So they had double the money and they were able to buy at yesterday's prices, right? So they really gained in real income. But what about the rest of us who slept in a little bit, uh, we slept in, or maybe we got this extra money and we thought, let's really think about what's the best thing to do with our money, this extra money that we found. Um, <clears throat> we find that us, we actually lost out because uh, we're making our purchases after the prices have risen. So our real purchasing power has, has fallen. So the increase in money supply did not benefit society as a whole, but the early spenders, the early spenders benefited uh, at the expense of the late spenders. So from that, we can see every money supply is equally optimal. Every amount of money is equally optimal to a large, uh, a, a smaller one is just as optimal as a larger one. It has no, a larger money supply, increase in the money supply does not benefit society. So nobody, including economists, including people at the Fed, nobody needs to be concerned with what the optimal amount of the money supply is and be you know, wringing their hands over, should we increase it or not? Should we increase the money supply? Should we contract the money supply? Okay, so under the gold standard, <clears throat> the only way to increase the money supply is to dig more gold out of the ground, right? If you want to have more money and gold is money, then we have to get it out of the ground. Well, that is a costly activity that requires scarce resources, uh, time, labor, tools to be going and digging the gold out of the ground. So the amount of gold mining that's done is actually going to be determined by profitability of mining, right? The profitability of mining, of course, is affected by the costs of mining. Okay, so if those costs fall, then the production of new gold or mining more gold would increase. If the costs increase, uh, the cost of mining increase and in production would uh, be cut back or maybe disappear completely. One factor that affects the cost of production is the price level, right? So if the price level rises, the prices of resources used in mining gold, those are also going to be affected. So um, <clears throat> uh, if the prices of resources used in mining gold increase, then production of gold decline. So that's going to uh, be the opposite case when the price level when the price level falls. So an increase in commodity money like gold or silver um, is going to affect the money supply, but also we're, and, and therefore the price level. But we also have this other benefit because it is a commodity money, this uh, gold can be an increase in gold could be beneficial to society because it can be used uh, in consumption and production uses. We can have jewelry, we can have electronics made out of it. So, um, <clears throat> uh, okay, so that's gold. So you can get, you can get gold uh, by buying it or you can mine it. Another way you could get it fraudulently is by counterfeiting. Okay, uh, and counterfeiting uh, is going, the, looking at counterfeiting is going to give us some insights into the inflation process. Okay, so Let's say there are some bad guys who get together and they counterfeit some gold coins. And the gold coins are actually made of brass, but these fake gold coins, they just pass them off as dollars in the marketplace and they go undetected when they spend them. So they spend these fakes in the market and they increase the money supply and increase the demand for goods. And so it's increasing the price level um, and decreasing the purchasing power of money not just for the fakes, but for also the rest of us, the good guys, our, our money, okay? So this is just like the Angel Gabriel model, but can you pick, point out one 
crucial distinction. It's not that Angel Gabriel came down, uh, or it's not that we all counterfeited and made our fake gold coins, right? It's that the bad guys did this, and so the money is injected and enters the economy at a specific point, right? So, um, <clears throat> so the uh, gold, the fake or the brass coins, they enter at a specific point and they spread and the fakes get spent and re-spent. So the result is the demand for these local goods where the bad guys were, the demand for those goods increase first and therefore those prices rise and then it spreads as those fake coins are spent and re-spent throughout the economy until really all prices are affected. So the counterfeiters and those they buy from first uh, and the ones who get the money early in the process, they benefit at the expense of the ones who get it much later or not at all. So think about the people who are on fixed incomes and they never see, they never see more money coming into their account. They are worse off. They have the same income as before, but they now have the higher prices. So counterfeiting is really a subtle method of fraudulently gaining at the expense of the rest of society uh, through the inflation process. Okay, so uh, last thing I'll say is we would not expect money to be paper, right? We would not expect money to be paper because paper does not have any intrinsic value. We throw it out all the time. Um, we would not expect money to be national because then we're really back to at the border if you live, say, if each state had its own money, we're in Auburn, we're really close to the state line in Georgia. If every state had their own money, we're back to double coincidence of wants at the state line, right? I, I, I want to buy something in Georgia, but I've got Alabama money. I need somebody who's selling stuff and wants Alabama money. So um, also we wouldn't expect it to be under the control of any particular entity because it doesn't need to be. We just talked about how any supply of money, any amount of money is just as good because as any other, we don't need to be controlling it and, uh, you know, fine tuning the, the amount of money in circulation because any amount of money is just going to, the price level will adjust so that we can have all transactions facilitated with the amount of money that we have. <clears throat> So why then do we have uh, national paper money under the control of a central bank? Well, it's as we saw with the example of the counterfeiters, with the example of the counterfeiters, issuing currency transfers wealth to the one who's issuing it, right? If I come up with uh, some way to trick you into accepting, you know, the Sandy dollars, then, and they're just fake worthless things, then I'm, I, I'm gaining, right? So there's a transfer of wealth to the one who issues the, uh, issues the currency. So a monopoly in the provision of money uh, is really the most valuable to, tool for the state to have, and that's what we see, that's what we see today. So you're going to learn more this week about central banking as well as, as, well as fractional reserve banking and the Federal Reserve um, next with uh, Patrick Newman. So thank you very much.